So welcome, we start uh, this webinar, the third edition of a preservation immigration uh, seminar. Uh, this year, the title is uh, Preservation Life Cycle. Uh, I invite you all to uh, have a look at uh, the Fiat IFTA website and find uh, the, the page of the um, Preservation Immigration Commission to know better about uh, us uh, and the members and our work. The members of the commission are also panelists into in, in this uh, webinar and uh, they will uh, uh, help in answering uh, your question. But uh, first of all, uh, I would say that one of our members is also the president of uh, the Fiat IFTA, Brecht de Klerk, and uh, I, I hand over uh, to him uh, for, for the official coming. Thank you, Laurent. Thank you um, to all the uh, participants to this seminar. Welcome, um, participants all over the world. So I see there are many of you. So uh, I'm very grateful to see so many of you today uh, participating to this uh, seminar. Um, I want to um, recommit, I would say, um, Fiat IFTA to the cause of um, digital preservation. I think that the uh, subject of which uh, the commission members and experts, invited experts, will be talking today is uh, very, very, very relevant in the world of uh, television, media archives in general, digital uh, archives in general today. And that's just, that is also the reason why the, um, the group has uh, chosen this uh, subject today. I, um, uh, I'm not gonna steal too much time of the speakers. I just want to point to Fiat, Fiat IFTA's activities as a whole. For those who don't uh, know Fiat IFTA very well, I'd like to point to our website, fiatifta.org. There you can find much more on the top right of the website. You will find a link to register for the newsletter if you want to stay uh, involved with us, uh, if you want to know the other activities that we're deploying throughout the year. And I would also like to uh, point especially uh, also to uh, one of our next events, um, which uh, will be in uh, October next, uh, October 17th to October 20th. I will be welcoming you in uh, the sunny side of Switzerland, as we call it, uh, the southern part uh, in the city, beautiful city of uh, Locarno, where we will hold our annual World Conference 17th until 20th of October. The program of the World Conference, as well as the registration form, will be uh, announced in the upcoming week. So I would say register for the newsletter and you will uh, stay informed. Without further ado, uh, and once again, my thanks to the uh, to the full group of the Preservation and Migration uh, Commission. Without further ado, I will uh, leave the world the word to uh, Laurent and to announce the first speaker. Go ahead, Laurent. Uh, th thank you, thank you very much, Greg. Um, before uh, uh, ending over to Richard Wright for the for this wonderful overview, just uh, some practical questions. So uh, uh, the audience can write the questions uh, and uh, the panelists can answer in writing. Uh, however, at the end we have uh, a time for for uh, discussing uh, for uh, answering question uh, in speaking. Um, also, we have a number of polls. Uh, for you. We will begin very soon with a polls. Uh, there, there are a few questions. You, I invite you all to, to be quick, uh, to not to think too much. Uh, if, you do, if you don't know, ex there is not a right answer. It is uh, interesting to know uh, some aspects uh, related to the topics uh, of the seminar in, in this way. Uh, the polls will always be, be before the topic is presented, so, so to make it more interesting. Um, and now I hand over to, to uh, uh, Richard Wright, the preservation guide, and uh, uh, also to the related poll on this overview. So the title is, you have gone digital, now what? Okay, uh, thank you, Laurent. I haven't uh, done this poll in the rehearsal, so I'm not quite sure what happened next. So uh, can somebody start the poll? Oh, yes. Okay. Christo Christoph is managing. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Christoph. So, uh, there are right. four questions I see. First, first thing, are you dealing mainly with, with what? With ki which kind of content? If it is digital uh, or, or born or, or digitized or a mixture? Um, 
Okay. As as I said, for all the polls, uh, we don't want to to use too much time for that. So basically, we we are counting the second and saying something, commenting the questions. The other question was: Do you have a computer system for managing digital content? It is a dam, a mam, or equivalent. What uh, what else? Oh, are you confident that your digital material is still valid? And the last question, how do you check for valid files? Okay, so I hope everyone has uh, had a chance to just give a few seconds thought to, to the poll. Um, Yes, uh, in the in the meanwhile, uh, uh, with the results will be shown, will be available. But you you can go, you can start, uh, Richard. Okay, right. So uh, whether you've answered the questions or not, here I come. Uh, 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 we let... You've gone digital. Now what? Um, I really want to just set the context for dealing with uh, all of our digital material. How did we get here? We got here from analog material that we digitized. That was on shelves. We also had digital material on shelves, digital videotape, DVDs, um, debt, audio tapes. And, and all of this material had to become files to be accessible. Um, but if we go to the next slide. Um, it isn't just the analog material because in the last decade or even 15 years, we've had the born digital material and the born digital material just floods in because it's so easily acquired. If you are producing uh, a cinema feature digitally, all of your raw materials, this 300 hours of shooting that you might do before you get one hour of final product, all of that can be simply saved by pressing a button. It can be simply saved, but can it be simply preserved? Also, we have the proliferation of channels. Uh, on the right, you see what the UK UView system provides um, in terms of free digital channels. Uh, when I came to England in 1974, there were three channels. Um, so this is all this flood of material. Um, if we go to the next slide. So how do we deal with this material? Well, every time we have to do anything with the material, and if we're not doing anything with the material, then we're not in business. Uh, every time we do anything, uh, the files are touched. They come in, they're stored, they're backed up, they go out. Uh, this can't be done at scale manually. The, a manual approach just doesn't scale. If we have tens of thousands, we may have hundreds of thousands, and, and uh, some people may have more than hundreds of thousands of files. It has to be dealt with by automation, meaning computer systems, dam systems, uh, storage management systems. These systems have to be told what to do. And to tell them what to do, we have to know what to do ourselves. So what do we do? How do we manage these files? What are the simple, clear rules for taking care of your material. That's what the seminar is today. And now I really want to hand over to the speakers. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh, the results of the polls are, are available. But now we have to go to next uh, uh, next speaker, uh, who is Etienne Marchand uh, from INA. Pre and the topic is preventing digital obsolescence. Okay, thank you. Maybe just before we start the poll, uh, to introduce what, what this is about. Um, for, okay, so this is the first poll that showed yeah, exactly. again. Sorry, okay. sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh, that's okay. Um, for, for some time now, many archive organizations have been migrating their content, so that the legacy carriers, the tapes, the films uh, have, been, have been migrated for digital. The reasons for that uh, are, of course, to make access easier to the content, but it's also because uh, there's a risk of the original uh, carriers not being uh, available anymore because uh, they get old and the technology become obsolescent. So now we, we have more and more digital stuff, but uh, 
how do we know that uh, what we feared with uh, physical carriers won't happen again uh, with the digital uh, material? So um, I won't talk now about um, digital preservation technology like storage technology, but rather about uh, the encoding of the video and audio uh, material itself. So the way the data is coded uh, to digital. So the, the questions I, I ask you here, um, did you uh, ever witness a media file or a format becoming obsolete that you could not play back or, or convert or having difficulties to do it? And I'm already surprised to see that many positive uh, answers to that question. And uh, it seems also to be something that is worrying you. So uh, then it means it's a good topic, obviously. Um, because uh, from the outside, it looks like there are not that many different audiovisual file formats. But uh, actually, when you look at the different containers and video codecs and audio codecs and all the different profiles and parameters for each of those uh, video and audio streams, you can have almost endless variations of formats. So um, what are the consequences of uh, this very wide um, world of audiovisual digital formats? I think we can go. Yeah, next uh, slide, please. And uh, maybe so, we can uh, stop. among all those uh, different, I'm only showing here a few video codecs. Uh, we find that some of them have already become obsolescent in the sense that they are not being used anymore. Of course, it's not that simple because, because depending on on the field and on the regions of the world. Uh, I'm sure some people still use MPEG-1 somewhere, but mostly uh, we can consider uh, the format is rather obsolete. Yet, of all these formats, uh, we can still play them back uh, today because uh, we have a backward compati compatibility from all the software we use, at least mostly. Uh, but how can we make sure that this lasts uh, for forever because we want to keep it forever. Next, please. Uh, I take one example of um, things that happened to us at INA, so the, the French uh, audiovisual public archive. Uh, we migrated a lot of videotapes to JPEG 2000 format, that's a video encoding format. Uh, we have almost 800,000 files uh, in this format. And each of them were controlled thoroughly, at least we thought so. Uh, they went through different programs, a button for automatic checking, XF reader for manual check, and also FFmpeg, which was used to generate access copies uh, of everything. So after that, we were pretty sure that everything was all right in our digital archive, archive regarding this format. Yet, next slide, please. In around 2019, when pulling out some of those files from our digital archive and trying to convert them to a delivery format, we found out that some of them uh, were unreadable with FFmpeg that we use for the conversions. So we had to investigate and we found out there was a 40 batch that was made a few years before. It was not completely 40 because at the time we didn't notice anything. It means every file worked in the software we used at the time. But since there had been some software updates and FFmpeg didn't support anymore some of those files. So um, we wondered why and actually we also found out that because we are, we are one of the few users of this very particular format, uh, no one complained about it because uh, it's like we are the only one who, who noticed. So that's also a problem when you use the format that is not very widely uh, used. I'm talking about a particular flavor of interlaced JPEG 2000 that is not uh, in very uh, wide use. So we found a solution for that, but uh, that's still looked like a red flag about uh, the different file formats we had. So what we can do about that, 
Uh, next slide, please. Well, of course, uh, it's always necessary to check every file incoming. So that's the ingest stage in a digital archive. So we need to have automatic check. So that's what we do. Uh, we check various parameters, encoding parameters of the files and make sure they match what we are expecting. Next. But also we are trying to not only to check the file, but the formats themselves. So we have uh, hundreds of thousands of files, but we also have a few dozen of different formats. Uh, and for each of those formats, uh, we try to build a list uh, and that allows us to do a kind of risk assessment campaign every, let's say every year. It's not uh, formal yet, but that could be uh, something that would work. Every year we pull out samples of every file format we have in the archive. And the idea is to check all of those files against the latest versions of most of the relevant media software. That can be uh, video players, uh, editors, convert, conversion software, etc. So we see if retro compatibility is still uh, working on for those formats. Um, next slide. So we can end up with a kind of table uh, to simplify it that uh, will show you some, some warning when you start to have some things that don't quite uh, work out uh, as well as you expected. And the more warning you get, the more you can ask yourself, um, do I want to keep this file format in my archive? It's it's getting maybe a bit risky. So if indeed some file formats are, seem uh, look uh, risky to keep, uh, next slide, please. Uh, maybe we need to convert those files into uh, what we consider the more resilient format, the more sustainable format. And then uh, we would try to choose a format that is both sustainable according to the current uh, criteria and uh, which is at least the same quality of the source format so to degrade as little as possible uh, the quality of the content so there are a few guidelines that can be observed for that next please Another precaution that can be taken uh, for reducing this risk is archiving not only the, of course, the media files, but the software that work with those files. So as an example here, I listed a uh, few versions of FFmpeg that we have used over the years, and uh, it was indeed useful to have uh, older versions when we found out uh, we had a batch of files that didn't work with the latest versions. But if we go even further, uh, maybe we'll find that we need to also archive the platforms uh, that uh, allow this software to run onto. Because maybe we have an older program that run in 32-bit uh, and that won't work in a modern 64-bit platform. So we are not quite there yet, but uh, that's something we need to, to envision. Okay, next. So finally, I, I would say that, uh, in my opinion, th this is probably not the number one risk uh, we, re we, we face in the uh, archiving, audiovisual archiving world, but uh, that's not uh, one uh, measure that will take a lot of time. So it's certainly worth, I think, spending a bit of time just to uh, make sure you know perfectly well the formats you have in your archive and how compatible they, they remain with uh, modern environments. So uh, that's not a big investment. Probably a few days of work uh, every year can help to make sure that uh, your formats are OK. So it's a very limited investment. And talking about investment, investments, uh, it's uh -huh. long term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Etienne. Uh, uh, really interesting. Also interesting to look uh, at the results of the of the poll. Uh, a lot of people have already had some some trouble, and are, a lot of people are worried about. Yes, indeed. 
Okay. Um, so now we talk about the cost uh, of permanent preservation. First, uh, I think I wish to thank my colleagues, Andrea and Giorgio. They should be attending the webinar. <laughs> So well, they helped me in collecting data and information essential to this presentation. We are used to deal uh, with digitization costs, uh, which have been or are or will be quite significant for massive processes related to large collections. Instead, uh, this time we are invited to wonder on the cost of keeping digital collection on, on the long run, cost of keeping. So this is going to be about uh, almost about money which is not exactly our job, however, it is a part of the job. We are aware that uh, from a strategic perspective, technical decision and archive management decisions are not independent from uh, economic uh, considerations. Please uh, take note uh, or remember or come back later to this bibliography reference uh, that I used for the presentation, maybe just an example, but helpful for rethinking about the total preservation costs. Um, so the poll is open, I see. Um, there are um, six questions. Um, enjoy the question. Why is about the size of your collection? Easy. And uh, another one is about uh, planning or scheduling the planning. Uh, basically, which is the time horizon uh, you, are, you are working with. And uh, one about uh, issues and concerns. If any, just thinking. A couple of um, tricky questions on archive size and uh, the growth of archive. Of course, this is in relation to, to the costs, the question behind. So now I'll check. Oh, oh you are late. Uh, you, you were you are late for this poll. <laughs> Why? Uh, uh, can keep this for for uh, some seconds uh, because uh, we are even we have a good timing for now, but uh, this will not forever. Um, okay, better. I I will wait. I I will wait uh, somehow because I I, I don't want uh, you to be too thinking about the 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 questions and not uh, and not listening. So oh, I, I let Christoph to stop, okay, and uh, we will see later maybe the results and we we start uh, looking at this diagram. So just uh, again a note on the bibliography is not uh, is 2012 University of California. In, why this? Because uh, this diagram is also based on the, on that reading. We need to have uh, in mind a model of digital preservation system. Richard already <laughs> gave some, some hint and something around it. This uh, would recommend also reading OAIS model for those who know, I hope, uh, however, this picture is uh, general and simple enough. So the preservation system provides some services so we ask to whom there are content producers, those who put content into the system, hoping for preservation and a chance for future access. Other agents will have to get content out from the system. Until digitization is still in progress, the input flow is likely greater than the output flow. Then there must be an infrastructure which is made of uh, servers, an amount of storage, uh, and all the interfaces uh, uh, needed. The media preservation system is going to work with uh, content types. Well, what I mean by content types, uh, a combination of media file formats. As Etienne said before, <laughs> you cannot all, only look at the extension of the file name. Uh, there are, and even, even uh, there are a lot of configuration for each file formats. Typically, the media preservation system deal with a, a bounded set. We should not forget about the people, the staff, because uh, although the system will work, is expected to work as much automatically as possible, it will always require monitoring, intervention, and oversight. Moreover, 
the input and output workflows and the producers and the consumers will need the support. So every component, every mentioned part or agent of the system is related to a cost and all costs occur over time. Investments can be considered uh, as depreciation or with other equipment uh, life cycle criteria. Then we have labor and operating costs. Why not mention also financial costs or contingency costs? Let's now consider in theory a unit of content, whatever it is, could be one hour of TV program. For each period that we consider, there will be a cost for preserving that unit of content. Summing over time, this gives an always increasing cumulative cost for insisting preserving our unit of content. Now, if the cost is always the same, uh, let's forget about the inflation. Well, then cumulative cost is unbounded. Thus, as slowly as time goes on, it will get infinite. If instead of being static, the cost decrease in percentage, not reaching zero. Well, the magic is that the cumulative cost can be bounded. It's a kind of a symptom. Look at the bibliography if you want. What is critical is that we cannot be sure that our model will stay valid in the long run. However, for your unit of content, you can have an estimation of its total preservation cost till eternity estimation. You might even think of paying this amount in advance. If you are wrong, uh, nobody will complain. What about the case study? For our case study, right, case study, we looked at a period of 16 years, two thirds in the past, <laughs> one third in the future, so more, more an outlook. We got data about um, the infrastructure, the energy, the flow space, and the stuff. And then we wondered the cost of what are we talking about? Which are our metrics? How can we look at the data? Time is important. Then storage. Storage can be available storage, the total capacity or use storage. And the amount of media content, let's say in hours, hours of content. As an example, which is valid for RIFE format, uh, 30 gigabyte hour per hour format, having three copies for redundancy, it means that uh, one terabyte of storage uh, will be able to contain 10 hours of content. So there is this relation between storage and content amount. Well, please consider that you might organize things uh, using different kinds of storage for each copy and more demanding formats are about uh, to come uh, in the future. The preservation system of RAI is named Media Factory. It is a multi-tier architecture based on architecture based on LTO technology. The disk-based part is for serving input and output workflows. RAI is a television, so we must think of the television work. It does an archive, it's not only an archive. Input workflows come from digitization processes, from purchased content, for internally created new content. Output workflows are for content repurpose, for production or communication to the public or trade. You see that, uh, it, that this is modular, there is, uh, this is good for resilience. Uh, uh, it is because investments have, be, have been gradual. So it is made of two so-called asset repositories, each having two tape libraries. Over time, the storage capacity has increased, mainly because new assets were purchased. And only secondary because, okay, you can buy LTO cartridges to add into your libraries. The use of the storage is, uh, is the blue line. No, par sorry, the blue, the user storage is the orange line. Increased uh, because of input workflows. Uh, the output of digitization is the big one. If we look uh, at the cumulative uh, 
cost of the preservation system, well, we don't really see any asymptote here, not yet. Well, uh, we can show that we can be sure that the largest cost item is that of investment and maintenance uh, for the infrastructure. Energy, however, together with flow, uh, is far from being negligible. Labor, on the other hand, uh, seems to be marginal, or some cost didn't emerge in our study. If we look at the preservation system cost per year, we can appreciate the infrastructure cost decreasing at the end of the purchase, the big purchase period. This is the main reason for the decreasing of the overall cost. While that of energy looks quite stable, even increasing, but we must keep in mind that the price of energy, at least in Europe, has become a bit bustling these uh, last uh, years. Now the question is, uh, which was the cost uh, on a yearly basis for a unit of storage? Let's say, for example, one terabyte. Well, the, the values of this diagram come from those of the previous diagram divided by the capacity that we had uh, in our repositories for that year. You can see the distinction between user storage and deployed available storage. Obviously, the cost of user terabyte is higher. The two lines have about the same decreasing behavior over time, except for that peak on user storage in 2016. Well, that was because after having reached a better confidence on the LTO technology and the overall approach of the media factory, an important quantity of storage was made available that year. This diagram is based on the same data, but cumulative, cum cumulatively over time. Try to guess where the asymptotic values could find their place. Um, uh, this is not evidence that cumulative cost is bounded for the infinite far future, just uh, it would be possible with the current analysis and outlook. So a big warning also, how much higher the value is for the user capacity. The user capacity is uh, the double of the, of the available capacity. Lesson learned, better not having too much empty storage if the outlook uh, for the storage price is uh, for a decreasing price. You need some empty storage to allow ingestible flows while you, are, while you are purchasing and deploying new storage, but not too much. So assuming one terabyte for 10 hours of content, the total cost of preserving one hour of content could be bounded to 250 euros. Think of paying that when you you are pushing the ingest button, okay? At least. Well, could be less if you manage better the empty space. Um, first conclusion. Okay, let's pay attention to the preservation cost per unit of content. It is decreasing over time, but which is the main reason of that? Now, the answer is uh, for us. LTO technology, LTO technology and its generation roadmap. Carriers of new generation have greater capacity and lower cost per terabyte. So regular data migration keeps the number of carriers down. Anyway, regular data migration is required not only for that, but also for addressing risk on equipment reliability and equipment obsolescence. So you, you will do, you should do regular data migration anyway, but you change the carriers with the newer generation of LTO. Also, we have to say that archives uh, keep content, most archives keep content in various level, each one addressing a different need. Here, here we mentioned a master level that is, uh, either the digital original or the digital replacement of the original. And the mezzanine that uh, we normally use for a media production purpose. 
In television, in most cases, they are just the same. This is not true for film archive, for television film archive, but for all, in other cases, they are just the same. We might add a proxy level, but well, this is not for preservation. It's a, as the storage needs are different for the various level, there is room for some alternative strategies. Why do we have to keep three copies of all the levels? Could we accept some higher risk of losing some master if the mezzanine is kept safe? These are just questions without the answer at the moment. Regarding all the items, regarding the stuff, the cost per unit of content, per unit of content might decrease for a growing archive as the, the same team having the proper, proper tools and skills may still take care of it. A risk is uh, uh, losing people's skills uh, in, in case of changing technologies, architectures and solution. Regarding the flow, well, there is a clear relation again with the storage density, in turn related to the LTO roadmap. For the energy, we might wonder why its cost is important, since LTO tapes don't need much energy. But we must remind that our preservation system must support ingest and access workflows, not to mention data migration, all of these based on energy consuming drives, servers, disk, etc. Almost impossible avoiding talking about uh, cloud options in outsourcing preservation. I mean, it's quite easy thinking of trying cloud solutions for something that is not big scale and within a short period of time. Well, not exactly the media preservation case for large collection. It's perfectly reasonable that service providers offer long-term preservation as a service. It is reasonable, but uh, there is a big question behind it, around it. Right? As always in business, it's a question of trust. Trusted repositories and trusted providers. It's not something that can be just uh, claimed uh, on websites or uh, in advertising. The preservation capabilities of a provider must be certified regularly in a standard manner. An interesting read, uh, reading might be that standard ISO 16363 that defines a recommended practice uh, applicable to the entire, entire range of digital repositories for assessing their trustworthiness and can be used as a basis for certification. Okay, well, aired in Rai, we can study a scenario, but it will be for one copy only. A couple of concerns, one is about uh, the definition of requirements in that case for access, but also for submission. And uh, what plan for later changing the provider? Termination plan. Could be easier maybe for a small archive for which a solution on premise uh, can be a burden, the, the cloud option, I mean. The other concern is about prices over time. Can we trust that prices will decrease the same as the storage cost uh, costs are expected to do? So a lot of questions <laughs> for, for uh, uh, an improved anal analysis later. Ooh, ooh, a word, uh, one remark on the cost of keeping the original carriers after digitization. First thing is that that cost should be added to the total preservation costs. Good news is that there is no more need for demanding access terms, which were the big part of the cost. Floor is going to be the main cost, together with uh, energy from temperature and humidity control. Well, there are a lot of uh, strange uh, pricing policies around. Uh, under the proper pricing, pricing policies, it is possible to envisage, let's say, at 20 euros for storing one hour of content in the original carrier for, let's say, 100 years. It could be affordable, at least until there are clear benefits. 
and the bad news in some cases are without working equipment, there are no benefits at all, but it will be discussed in two minutes. I think. Um, final, the very end of some unanswered questions, other unanswered questions to think about. The first two are connected. Storage costs continuously decreasing is probably the key factor for keeping the cumulative preservation costs bounded. We have seen the figures till now, the outlooks, the roadmaps, but all these analysis will need to be repeated regularly. With new content coming in and without old content being dismissed, archive, archive grows, the archives grow over time. So this is a question of sustainability. How can something that always grows with unbounded costs be sustainable? Question. How can it, can it give back the value of the resources spent for it? And uh, this uh, carries to the last question. Uh, how do we measure the benefits of preservation? Well, the goal of preservation is opportunity of access for now and for the future. Although access will have its specific costs, we can say that all preservation costs can be seen as access costs spread over all the access occurrences. In other words, so the, the more you access and the less you pay for preservation. And uh, thank you. I, I don't know if the result of the polls were shown. I think yes. <laughs> so thank you and uh, and over to Emanuele. Hello. So let's start the poll, uh, Lauren. I don't want to add uh, some words now. I would prefer to let you uh, let you have the time to, to answer these very few questions just to understand the level of uh, the awareness about the topic. And then we can discuss afterwards during the, the presentation. So the, the poll race has been started now. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I, I just yes. commented the question. One is about awareness, yeah. but second is about uh, uh, do you think you are a target of uh, cyber attacks? And the third one is, uh, uh, do you think the security measures are appropriate to the risk or how much they are appropriate? And the last question is, is we are curious to know if you are uh, yourself involved in cybersecurity activities. Yeah. A commenting li live. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think that I think that is uh, seems to be a bit uncommon uh, questions for this kind of uh, let's say detect uh, on or workshop because it's not uh, so uh, not so common to talk about uh, security or cyber security or feeling as a feel as a target in the archives domain or cultural heritage in the general sense. So uh, this, is, this question is just to understand uh, which is the feeling. Uh, and so that uh, starting with the answer, we could, uh, uh, we could verify the possibility to open a new discussion, uh, not today, but for the future, uh, which are the opportunities that are ahead in front of us. Okay. Oh, it's very interesting. Uh, this, uh, yes and no, this, the, the, the distances between the two answers is not so big. Uh, it's good that the 60% reply yes. Uh, however, the 40% say no, this is uh, offer or present a kind of room to, to intervene for in, the, in this talk. Okay, let me 
uh, start my presentation. This uh, short uh, is a short introduction about the new risk, the new threats that uh, so far cultural heritages and archives are not, uh, we can consider that are not affected because uh, uh, we are used to see about the cyber attack related to bank uh, infrastructure or other kind of critical infrastructure, energy suppliers, uh, transport system. So what is defined a critical infrastructure also by the European Commission? However, the things are changing very quickly uh, in the last uh, couple of years, I would say. Um, so uh, the first thing uh, is the first uh, alarm right from UNESCO that highlight the, the trend of cultural cleansing that include digital heritage, not the physical heritage, because physical heritage is uh, um, uh, software, the, the, the this kind of threats or this uh, destruction threats uh, since the born of the humanity. So each time that a population wants to conquer another one, one of the, the strategy was to destroy their temple, their cities, and any kind of uh, put this population connected to the territory if you want to conquer someone. Uh, so th the things related to the digital heritage is something new. And so since the cyber attack is considered a legitimate form of warfare, also digital heritage should be considered a target. At, the, at this time. And it considers a target for two, ki two kinds of uh, actions, destruction and, uh, the, and the altering of the, of the archives. So uh, not that is related to the AI capabilities of not for the destruction, but to, uh, let's say, uh, changing uh, the, the content without, uh, in a way that is not detectable with the, some Which are the main motivation uh, related to the cyber attack? These are the main five identified in the literature and also in the current practice. First one is the intellectual property theft uh, that is related to stole some uh, some properties uh, to gain a financial uh, for financial gain or to gain a competitive advantage. That is typical in the industrial sector, but also and maybe it's not strictly, I would say, related to cultural heritage, I would say. Sabotage and vandalism, this is instead connected to the uh, cultural heritage. I would say also the current uh, initiatives of uh, eco, I would say eco terrorists that try to, <laughs> to uh, put some vandalism on, uh, on masterpieces in the museum and whatever. So these are physical attack, but the same could be translated also on digital. So someone want, could, uh, could make the similar kind of attack also to your archives or make money. So this is very common uh, uh, attack that occur, uh, for instance, in medical infrastructures where, uh, or in the public administration where someone press uh, a button in the email and a ransomware spread in the net uh, and uh, all the content uh, will be encrypted and uh, they ask for money generally with uh, in a cryptocurrency <laughs> to to unlock or to decrypt all the information of course the damage in case you refuse to pay would be huge but uh, in terms of time for recover and uh, and to not just for recovery for the data, but also for the service behind the data. Uh, let's think in terms of uh, health system or transport. Privacy breaches, okay, that is uh, focus on particular on digital identity uh, so that you can uh, retrieve information that are usually uh, covered by the privacy law and, and stuff like that. But the last one I think is the most critical for cultural legend and audiovisual archives is related to political or ideological motivation. 
So the, this is related to groups, uh, countries, or individuals that could target archives just not for destroying it, but to alter or adjust or make changes in order to, let's say, alter the, uh, the history or the memory of a country or about uh, an event. Uh, and this is, it has a long-term impact because uh, just think in terms of the, the, the huge amount of hours that are stored in the audiovisual archives. If I affect two, three frames in a spe specific piece of uh, video, no one is able to detect it unless uh, you continuously detect some uh, uh, the integrity of the archives, but also the attacker could alter for instance, if you use hash system, uh, you could alter the metadata and also uh, the, the, the frame of the video. And at that point, you, you will be very difficult to, uh, to understand what is happening and how to recover this situation. Next slide, please. Okay, this is a first example that uh, is happening right now to, so, to save Ukrainian cultural heritage online. It is because during the war, uh, the, the, let's say the bomb are not targeting only civil population or military installments or other, other kind of things, but also museum and cultural heritage um, places and institutions. So they uh, stand for starting initiatives that involve 1,500 volunteers uh, to collect, to retrieve as soon as possible all the digital content uh, stored in Ukraine and save them uh, in a other uh, server place in the US. Because we need to think that even if we try to work uh, in terms of uh, try to preserve uh, digital content against obsolescence. And also we try to save uh, our digital content against, I don't know, uh, outage or, uh, or um, uh, say cyber, uh, physical disruption of hard disk or stuff like that. So work in terms of the disaster recovery or business continuity in other less. If your content are placed, are stored within the country and your country is under attack, you risk to lose everything in any case. So uh, we need to open our mind in terms of, uh, let's say, new threats against war. So moving, try to start to think in terms of moving our content, digital content outside our countries in a safe and reliable way. The next slide, please. Okay, this is uh, the, the second uh, threats is related to AI-based attack. And you know that the AI capabilities are dramatically increasing during this month. Let's say, think about the chapter GPT or other, the, the new possibilities offered by deep fake and stuff like that. So then you could have recreated from scratch videos that are totally identical to others, but with some very minimal changes, that these minimal changes, if you are not able to detect them, they became memory, they became, they will be included in the history of the population. And, and in the future, they could be used to, te to teach history to the young generation. This means that we are able, or the, the attackers could able to alter the, car, the common background, the common, uh, knowledge of the population about uh, something, for instance. Uh, or, or you think in terms of AI generated text or voice synthesis, and you no one is able to understand if this the original one or has been altered. This the, the possibility to recreate an entire video, uh, also historical video, digitized video. So don't, don't, don't forget to the very new formats, but also uh, videos that have been digitized from uh, old tapes 
this can be recreated and altered by AI without any possibility to understand if, the, if it's the, uh, the original one coming from a digitization or not. And content manipulation is what I just mentioned. Next one. Just to give you an example of what uh, I'm studying, for instance, uh, at the university related to the medieval manuscripts. Uh, there is the possibility, because you know, uh, there are many amount of budget that has been invested for this at uh, by nations, uh, European Commission invests a lot of money on that. And if, for instance, if someone is able to uh, attack this uh, corpus of uh, content, uh, also not, not strictly necessary audio video, but also the digitized uh, version of manuscript, and it's possible to, for instance, alter it uh, commas uh, and moving commas around the, the text instead of the previous version or the original version, or just to change uh, some small uh, uh, words, Greek, ancient Greek words, and just to alter the meaning of, of uh, historical text, you risk to change uh, the, 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 the things or the, the objectives or the, the, the history about everything. Uh, just think in terms of how the Holy Bible can be translated. You have a lot of different translation, okay? If, uh, and, but there are, of course, some original uh, version digitized. But if I try, I, if I'm able to alter this, this original version uh, and someone afterwards uh, start to, 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 to read that, is able to create a totally different introduction, tra translation of it. Uh, this is uh, the risk, the next one, the impact of this action uh, are twofold. The first one is to generate fake historical information, distort cultural heritage and push specific narratives. This is very uh, critical uh, for ideological or for many other, other things. And the, the other, Aspects is related to undermine the authenticity, the integrity, and trustworthiness of digital archives. If you no one really or trust content retrieved from your archives, we are in trouble because no one is able to say what is true and what is not, what is original and what is not, what is uh, reliable, reliable to be mentioned or to be cited in a in a research and what is not. And the second point is related to the uh, financial damage. If, I, if you destroy your uh, digitized content and at the same time, the original one is no longer available, less than there is a very common in the digitization domain. You digitize something because you want to preserve something from the physical disruption. And this physical disruption could occur but also, if the, the master copy of your digitization is, will, will be altered, no one is able to retrieve the original one. And the, the, the original content will be lost forever. Uh, and also the memory about it. Not, not in this generation, but at least in the next one, because also the people that work on the physical one uh, will die <laughs> for, first or less, and, uh, and the next generation are not, are not able to retrieve the, the knowledge from the people. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is uh, the call to action that I imagine and, uh, and I, I would say recommend. Of course, the discussion is just at the beginning one uh, because consider uh, the cultural heritage as a target is a very new, I think. But so I, I think the strategy is to start to consider digital cultural heritage as a critical infrastructure. And so include the museum, archives, galleries, and so, so forth and so forth within the same uh, protection domain. So connect the archives to the uh, National Cybersecurity Center and also to consider a, a signal of concern, the increasing, uh, the increment of a cyber attack to the cultural heritage archives. Uh, 
that at, at the moment no one they care about. The second point is related to investing in cybersecurity and cyber defense, also in cultural heritage domain. So at the moment we have many, I would say many experts in digital preservation because digital preservation is well grounded, but are we sure that we have enough competencies in cultural heritage organization about the cyber security, not in terms of email or in terms of, okay, no one stop my server, in terms of this new sophisticated kind of a cyber attack. The third one is related to, to include these threats in the digital preservation life cycle. And so uh, the, since we want to uh, teach, uh, there are many uh, guidelines or courses or workshops like this one about the digital preservation would be great, I think, to start to think about not only physical, or digital obsolescence, but also survive the digital content. Because in terms of resilience, resilience is not mean to avoid something because it's impossible to avoid a cyber attack, but to survive against something that definitely first, before or less, will occur. So we need to, to define a resilience strategy about digital archive in this regard. And the last one, uh, I, since the, this kind of risk are global, also the solutions should be global and would be great to have a global initiatives that start to connect cultural heritage institutions at least, like what has been done like locks or other networks that, for digital preservation that are transnational in, in view of if a country is under attack, they could uh, provide the service to save whatever is needed. And also start with the new standards, certification, not for instance, we have track, track for trust digital repository certification for trustworthiness. Let's think in terms of including this trustworthiness certification, also cybersecurity in this respect and new guidance. That's all. I leave the floor. Thank you very much, Emanuele. Stay, stay in contact because uh, later there could be uh, questions. <laughs> so uh, we are in time. I hand over to Christophe and um, for for the for the debate. So a, a group work uh, on the on the on the dismission problem. So please, Christophe, you can introduce uh, the the thing. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, of course, a part, uh, especially in your presentation, Laurent, was uh, the cost of keeping the originals uh, should be uh, a part in in the calcul overall calculation of uh, an ongoing uh, uh, preservation uh, project. So. Uh, uh, since it has been, uh, has been quite a topic already in Fiat IFTA and in, in uh, other communities, uh, we also wanted to address uh, now the question, is it ever okay to let the originals, the old carriers go? Um, you already see we have an, uh, again a poll open and I want to ask you to uh, answer the questions uh, uh, really quickly without thinking too much, uh, just uh, to, to, to get a first overview on this. So I uh, will quickly go uh, through uh, the questions. So uh, did you ever dare to dispose of original carriers? Uh, so this is just a, a single choice. Of course, uh, uh, the uh, first answer never uh, includes, of course, uh, uh, but, uh, maybe, uh, but we are thinking of, and uh, we might be uh, forced to do so in the future. The uh, second one is uh, a question, if not why, so what was the reason you uh, haven't been a daredevil here? Uh, and the third question, uh, uh, if you didn't do so uh, uh, far, uh, what is uh, your view in the future here? The fourth question is, um, um, if you uh, already discarded uh, some of the old carriers, uh, uh, well, have you ever been in the situation where you 
would want to turn back time. And last but uh, not least, uh, it's uh, the question about the formats uh, you think would be the best candidates uh, to be uh, discarded. So let's see how the poll stands. We have now uh, approximately a little bit more than 40% of the participants answered. So please speed up. I'll leave uh, the poll open for another couple of seconds. So there are still answers coming in. Now more than 50% uh, have been participated. That's looking good. I'm waiting about uh, two thirds of the audience to answer it. And now it starts slowing down. We, we can we can leave it uh, for a few seconds. Yeah, we, we just leave it. Uh, I will start uh, now. Uh, before we start our debate here, uh, uh, we want to give you a few uh, uh, overviews of current situation uh, out of four different uh, um, institutions who already uh, dealt with this question. We'll start right away with uh, Etienne and the situation at INA in Paris. Etienne, it's yours. Thank you, uh, thank you, Christophe. And uh, yes, uh, our situation is rather simple, probably compared to others, because there is a law that says uh, we are supposed to preserve the original program elements, uh, the original program and the elements that contributed to their production. So actually, there's a bit of a gray area uh, as to what is meant by elements, because I don't believe it's written black and white uh, that um, these, we are talking about physical carriers. So we could probably um, interpret it in different way. But so far, we are keeping uh, almost everything. The only thing we, we have uh, thrown away are things that we know uh, for sure we cannot do anything from it, like carriers that, that have uh, degraded beyond uh, repair. Beyond repair, we cannot fix them anymore. We cannot play back, and we won't be able even with uh, the evolution of technology. So th that's the only one we, we threw away. Uh, and also, of course, intermediate elements and copies, so duplicates uh, that we don't need to keep. So we keep them because we have a legal legal bound to do it. But uh, still, it has been useful so far uh, for a few situations. For example, uh, the film material that we have, uh, which is mostly 16 millimeter film, was transferred uh, massively to digital beta cam started in the 1990s. And today we are very happy to still have the 16 millimeter films uh, so we can rescan. Maybe not all of them because there are really many, but at least a selection of them to 2K resolution, which uh, really brings something more out of the original elements. Uh, same for the audio recordings. Uh, we digitized everything at 48 kilohertz for our uh, radio collection. Uh, and today we have people that ask us for a high resolution, 96 kilohertz or 192, and they actually pay us for that because they want to edit some concerts. Uh, so we are happy we can redigitize them uh, for them. And also, uh, we found out that, especially in the first years of digitization, uh, we have made, of course, a, a few mistakes, uh, something, uh, some transfers that were not properly monitored and uh, some files that were not properly controlled. Uh, so uh, we still have to pull out from time to time an original element from the archive to redo uh, the digitization. So this is our situation uh, at INA. And now it's who's next? Thank I don't you. remember. Miroslav. Yeah. Okay, Miroslav. I Hello from Ireland. Um, this, I'm going to talk about the situation at RTE, which is the Irish national broadcaster, and how we are thinking. So we're not rushing to throw away anything. We're, we're being very pragmatic. And for starters, we're confidently can say that film will be kept probably forever. 
uh, because film has a proven proven track record it will stand the test of time and also new technologies are emerging for high resolution scanning restoration in both domains so that's a special case really uh, when it comes to film now as christoph mentioned uh, the question of candidates for uh, carriers that are uh, candidates to be discarded or disposed of uh, where we're typically talking about magnetic and optical carriers. So this is um, a lot of different formats of uh, videotapes and uh, and audio tapes, uh, cassettes, um, optical media such as CDs, DVDs, etc. So first of all, our thinking starts on the premise that when it comes to mass digitization projects that we're currently doing, that we will only do them once. That's our hope, that, that we, we won't need to do it again for whatever reason. But then uh, uh, we, we want to gain confidence that, that what we have achieved during digitization process for each a piece of content, for each media, is that it's a true replica, which means that, okay, if there are some errors and artifacts on the original carrier, on tape or whatever, then okay, that cannot be fixed, that, that will be there. But, but if there are some errors in the resulting uh, digital file in digital domain, um, uh, we want to know that they weren't on the original carry, that they weren't introduced during the process of digitization. So that's one of the, one of the concerns and one of, one of the worries that we have. And, and for that reason, we put, Christoph will talk more about it later, uh, about a lot of steps, uh, stop gates in, in quality checking, validation in this process to cast that net really wide to catch any problems as much as we can in automatic fashion. And actually, initially, we talk, speaking of file integrity validation, that we thought we were maybe overly careful because we designed our digital workflows for receiving submission information packages containing digitized audio content to automatically check validity of every single file. So we said, well, maybe we are being too strict here. But then, um, then a couple of months into the project, we started seeing some failures, which made us very happy. It, it meant that uh, we weren't over, overly careful at all, that, that we were right to impose such stringent rules for file integrity validation and, and many other checks. So, so this is why it's so important to be so disciplined in, especially when you're doing this on, on mass, uh, we feel that uh, you know one small error can have ripple effect if it's a faulty machine that did the transfer, etc. Now, uh, obviously, the, the the second question is sort of stems from the approach to film and how there is technology developing in the in the world of film, but in when it comes to magnetic optical media, we don't really see or expect there will be new equipment that will give us a better copy than what we can already get, and. Um, so so we doubt that will happen and um and and that's kind of pushing us in direction of well we should probably cut those costs that uh, Laurent talked about earlier uh, of long term preservation and and can start thinking about maybe disposing of those carriers at some point in time so Currently, our pragmatic approach is, is saying, well, we're now in this interim period until we gain confidence, full confidence that each file is a true replica of the original. So we're thinking of um, storing those carriers, which are boxed up as they were boxed up for outsourced migration, migrations and, and digitization, uh, keep them at, in inexpensive um, storage, uh, in cost-effective storage, and hope that we will never need to do what Etienne described that they needed to do sometimes in Ina to kind of reach out for for those originals to to see if we can make better copies etc and then of course once that period of time passes which we're currently estimating is maybe three to five years we would consider keeping samples several samples of each type of carrier and each type of machine if we still have it uh, for posterity for future for research for for new generations of, of uh, archivists uh, who are looking after archiving and preservation to see where all this content actually came from. So I hope this describes our thinking in RT at present. And, uh, and uh, we'll go from Ireland now to Belgium and Marine will tell you about the thinking in, in VRT. Thank you.
Yeah, thanks Miroslav. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so at VRT, uh, for those you, of you who do not know VRT, it's the Flemish broadcaster in the northern part of Belgium, Dutch speaking part. Um, we have uh, three TV channels, five radio channels, and as Richard mentioned in his introduction, an enormous growth in digital born material. So uh, a, a lot of challenges there. Um, but uh, let's talk about our old carriers. Huh? Um, like Christoph said in his introduction, uh, what about the original carriers? So a lot of our physical carriers are not original anymore. We have made copies in the in the past. Um, so that's an extra factor to, to take into account. Um, at VRT, we had different uh, mass digitization projects. We started in 2005 for the different uh, types of carriers um, and all the uh, factors mentioned by Miroslav Etienne uh, are also valid at VRT. But in this uh, uh, discussion, we would like to uh, address an extra uh, factor and that's um, probably some of you have uh, faced this challenge as well as, as for us. We are moving to a new building and it's a smaller building. So, um, Square footage, cubic uh, feet, uh, especially in Brussels, is quite expensive. Uh, taken into account, you need uh, energy to keep it cool and um, moisture controlled. So um, the decision was made not to take all the carriers to our new building. What will uh, we definitely keep is our uh, film collection. Uh, we have about 60,000 reels which will be moved to the, the new building. And also some other, um, well, let's say uh, unique uh, carriers, probably some, our vinyl collection, photo collection will, will be moved as well. But um, magnetic and optical carriers uh, will probably be discarded. Um, yeah, I have another slide because yeah, when you discard uh, something, there's always a risk uh, that may need it in the future so the importance of quality control is uh is is really imminent uh, and we did have some qc issues in the past and uh, so as you saw we're moving to a new building in 2026 we have from now until then to fix those issues and if needed re-digitize some uh some carriers um, so we have some projects in place to do quality checks on one hand and do some corrections or re-digitization uh, in case we cannot correct digitally. And then a side note as well, um, because the um, uh, technology is always evolving um, and we're also looking at the, at AI to support us in, uh, in this matter. Um, and we have already seen some of those examples uh, like Everyone has seen the colorized black and white movies. Huh? Um, I wouldn't call that restoration. I would call that a creative uh, uh, example. Um, but maybe there will be some techniques in the in the future who can help us, uh, even if we have discarded our carriers and we um, we get into an issue with certain certain digital files. Maybe there will be. AI helping us in the future to restore those to the original uh, quality. Okay, we, things we, we lost now for a short moment, but you, you have an, uh, already an end. Okay, great. Uh, so, well, <laughs> now <laughs> the situation at ORF, uh, and we are definitely here in this group, let's say the bad guys. Uh, because we already do it, we are not thinking about it. Uh, uh, we already done it with quite a lot of, of uh, um, content. We've uh, and I've uh, looked up uh, the the numbers uh, this very morning, and we've thrown away already more than 1.5 million of carriers uh, in the last uh, six years. Of course, uh, it was not uh, actually our idea as an archive. Uh, we also had the, the demand that the space used by the archive 
uh, was needed elsewhere. We didn't move to a new building, but others uh, in Vienna moved to our building. And uh, so therefore we had to, to, to make room for that for them. And of course, we had a deal with our upper management. You get the money for your uh, preservation and migration project. And at the end of it, we want to have a lot of free space out of it. Uh, so we had uh, this as uh, a goal already written uh, on our to-do list. Uh, already a lot of things has been said here about uh, uh, the different aspects. Uh, maybe uh, I want to add that during uh, the time you also lose a lot of know-how about the old carriers. So old, old technicians retire, uh, old equipment is not working anymore. You don't get any spare parts. And if so, you have to pay them by gold bars. Uh, so it's definitely another nice situation. So there is also the ch a chance to have some additional uh, savings here. Of course, on the, the contra uh, side, is uh, we kept uh, during decades every uh, 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 every level, every original, although we made copies. Uh, so we still uh, got 10 years ago, all of our two inch tapes of our one inch B and C tapes and so on and so forth. Uh, because uh, security was also done through redundancy. So if, for example, the modern uh, DigiBeta had some issues, we always could step back to one of the previous uh, formats, maybe to the one inch B or even the two inch uh, tape. But now uh, we have files, redundancy is not really a problem anymore. Uh, uh, and we see uh, this on that uh, thing uh, solved. Uh, the preservation of originals, uh, since we are not a museum, is not our demand. Our task is we have to uh, keep the content, not the carrier, safe. So uh, therefore, we on only kept uh, our film collections and we handed it over to the Film Archive Austria because they are the experts of film. So we don't have to keep uh, this uh, expertise um, uh, as well. And then, of course, we had a lot of uh, discussion. Uh, might there be some future digitization technologies where we get much more out of the tapes we get now? Uh, we see this definitely uh, uh, still in film. There is still a lot of uh, potential in it. You heard what Etienne uh, told about 2K scanning of 60 mil film and so on. Uh, but uh, we don't see this, especially for magnetic tapes. Uh, there might be one or the other steps, even in the future, but it wouldn't be a big leap. It would be only a very small part. Nobody else uh, of, uh, but a real expert might see any difference here. So uh, the last point we discussed was possible losses. Uh, during the process without not enough control. Uh, and then after uh, a couple of years to say, oh, why did we uh, throw away the originals or the in-between copies? Since we started throwing away everything, we didn't have this situation once. And from day to day, uh, this uh, span, uh, uh, spans and giving me a better, uh, 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 let's say, feeling every day uh, about that, that we've took th that decision. Uh, next slide, please. And here I want to uh, talk a little bit about what I said right now, and also Miroslav mentioned it. It's all about quality control. The blurry image on the left, and it's blurry uh, on intent, uh, is just a, a, a quick overview of our current digital migration uh, project. And all the exclamation mark signs are on that steps in the process where we have quality control. And yes, there are eight steps where we do quality control. Not on all steps, we control everything. Some of those are only spot checking, uh, but they're always done by different people. Um, uh, migration experts, archivists, documentalists, uh, 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 journalists, and so on and so forth. We get different aspects, 
on the uh, thing we are doing and also on the quality of what we are producing. And included in uh, those eight steps are two uh, 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 similar but different steps where each frame of the digitized content is completely controlled uh, for impairments or, uh, as well on the digital as also if they might come from the analog uh, side. If it can be, uh, let's say, taken care of, so we still have, uh, before we digitize it, all the old carriers, we try to access them and get a better, better digital copy. But for example, if the problem was already uh, uh, gone to the tapes uh, during recording, uh, sometimes they already come from, from, the, from the camera signal and so on and so forth. And now we got from each file uh, a very precise list of impairments with each the number of the frame where the impairment is. And this brings me back to, to Moran, uh, who, who talked about future AI tools that might even automatically take care of those. At least now we have the metadata where the problems might be. Uh, so um, maybe a, a additional step in the future um, is definitely possible. Last words about uh, security now, uh, also addressing what Emanuele, for example, uh, addressed. Uh, we have, uh, we try to address the, the, the good old thumb rule of uh, three copies and two different uh, uh, technologies and one of them on a different uh, uh, side somewhere else. We have our main copies on two uh, digital uh, uh, hard disk uh, storage. They are uh, a, a worm technology, so they can be uh, written only once. Uh, no file can be erased from those. So uh, they should be kept pretty sure here. We also have an, an extra copy uh, on LTO tape. Nothing is erased here as well. And the third copy is also far away from ORF. It's uh, stored by the Austria press agency who is also quite involved in security issues here and we think we also found here a perfect partner for this. So this is the situation of uh, four different audiovisual archives, um, uh, all uh, three of us more or less in the broadcasting domain, only Ina is uh, 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 not directly a broadcaster. But uh, uh, now, when we look at uh, uh, our polls here, 50% uh, never uh, ever uh, did it so far, which is uh, 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 quite a lot. I've expected uh, less, uh, so uh, much more that at least thrown away about up to 5%. But also interesting enough that at least we got around approximately 7% who already thrown away uh, more than 50% uh, uh, of their overall amount of carriers. Interesting enough, uh, it seems that uh, a lot of us are, uh, only a few of us are limited by law. So, uh, uh, for example, at ORF, uh, it definitely says we have to keep the content. It never talks about any, any uh, elements or whatsoever. It definitely sees about the recorded content, and which helps us, of course, uh, to argument uh, 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 things like uh, throwing away original carriers here. Uh, of course, uh, fears uh, are, are big, but uh, well uh, uh, spread uh, over the dis different uh, uh, choices here. And uh, I would uh, just looking at the time, we are around uh, uh, at the end uh, of our program. Uh, Laurent, do you think we have uh, uh, just uh, another approximately five to 10 minutes to have an open mic sessions? Uh, so if uh, you from the audience want to ask some questions or to bring in some arguments. Uh, um, uh, we we uh, definitely uh, have, have the time for, for, uh, for the question and, mm -hmm. uh, and also, well, uh, I don't know if uh, um, 
among you, the, or the four of you or the other panelists who want to say something more on, on this because uh, it was meant to be a debate. Any yeah. criticism uh, uh, from uh, one approach to another one, uh, things like that? I'm terribly shocked by what I just heard. <laughs> 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 I had a quick question. Uh, when you started uh, discarding carriers, did you have to do some kind of what I would call um, a retrospective QC campaign of all digitization? You you thought maybe this batch, we are not sure, we need to recheck them before we throw the original carriers. Uh, uh, luckily, uh, we did had to because we already had this on our to-do list. So we've been prepared. Uh, in the first three years of our uh, digitiza big digitization campaign, we didn't throw away anything, but we did as if. So they were kept in a, in a special storage. They haven't been put hadn't been put back on shelves. So they were ready to be disposed. After three years of not even one incident, uh, we decided to speed up. And now, uh, let's say within uh, 72 hours uh, between digitization uh, and the very end of the process, uh, uh, and this is, let's say, uh, the, also the end of the original carrier. OK. Thank you. I would have a question for the, this, those who dismiss. Uh, in your organization, at which point such a decision can be taken? Uh, I, I don't know if the question is uh, <laughs> clear enough, uh, as it is an uh, irreversible decision. So who is uh, the owner of that decision? Is there, is there any 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 document, uh, uh, any any plan, uh, which criteria ha have to be met to be before the decision is taken? Uh, since we are the big uh, uh, ones here, I would say it was, of course, a more or less common decision. We had a lot of discussions, especially, of course, with the producing department and so on and so forth. But at the end, it was our decision that has been taken in the archives because we kind of uh, compile all the different positions in the company and we had uh, finally decide whether it is, is safe to, 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 to get rid of the old carriers or not because in the future only we will be blamed even if any other would have taken full uh, responsibility in the time of the decision. But one year after, uh, everybody would have for forgotten. So therefore, in fact, it was our decision and still is. Thank you. Looking around. There are two questions in the Q&A. Uh, maybe we yep. can address these live. Yes, sure. Um, and about... Uh, Okay, uh, just an issue. Do we do uh, the audience can write questions in the QA uh, on, on any of the topics? Okay, so we no problem. Uh, so, the last two questions are about uh, uh, discarding carriers. Okay, so, so Marin, take, uh, take care of that, that. Find the question and then and answer one. <laughs> So the first question, it was by an anonymous attendee, so we don't know who it is. Huh? So no policy in their archive um, um, and problems with their vault. So the revamp is needed, but no budget. How to deal with such a situation? Um, yeah, we, we don't have an answer for that, um, but budget is in many cases uh, a driving factor for decisions uh, on the discarding uh, policy, uh, especially in public organization, I think uh, it's uh, it's very um, well. It's likely for for all of us, um, but yeah. Uh, so no no answer here. But uh, take uh, take with you the 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 things the colleague said about QC etc. Uh, are really important in uh, in taking these decisions. 
maybe a small hint uh, from me here for this situation, because I know a lot of people, uh, also in Europe, uh, a lot of collections have the same problem here. Try to find a kind of uh, um, a large tower project here. Uh, try to digitize, preserve uh, a special part, a very small part in your archive. Try to find, uh, let's say, um, a support in your company on the production side, in the program, where you digitize this material for, and then show what great programs you can do with this uh, preserved and, and uh, a uh, saved material. Uh, maybe this can be a, a, a valid argument to then broaden up the scope. I know it's quite hard to do everything on it, but at least you should uh, do an overall plan that oh, maybe also uh, spreads over decades. So where do we have to start? Because things are already rotting away. What ca can we... Uh, if everything goes uh, down the river, uh, can we leave out of the scope because the content isn't that important? And so on and so forth. Try to split up the things so the overall problem doesn't look too big and uh, find some good examples where it uh, makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, regarding, uh, regarding, uh, so, sorry, regarding the votes, uh, also I would say that uh, um, the digitization of the carriers is a key factor for, for changing the place of the carrier, even if you don't dismiss. There is no reason to keep a digitized carrier in, in the center of the capital city of your country, uh, where it is, of course, uh, floor very expensive. <laughs> so uh, instead of uh, renewing all the stores, better to change the store. or dismiss, of course. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Marine, again, uh, you. Hello. Um, so um, maybe just add something, uh, what Kestov said. Uh, another tip could be to look for partnerships. Uh, like uh, ORF looked for a partner for their film collection. Um, maybe there is in your country also uh, some organization to partner up with to get uh, to, to do it together and get public funding. Uh, Okay, um, the next question. Does anyone have experience on recycling carriers such as wiping hard drives? Mm -hmm. um, if any of the colleagues wants to take that one or uh, for, from VRT. Um, so we have a hierarchical storage management system. So we don't know where our digitized files are on which drive. Um, so it's the it's the HSM system who manages that for us. Uh, and hard drives are uh, replaced on a regular basis. Uh, um, so on recycling carriers, um, physical carriers, is that, if that was the question? Uh, yeah, I think a lot of us have done that uh, because they were quite expensive in the past. So they were reused for, for different purposes or to recapture uh, new material. Um, so for VRT, we have, in uh, by doing that, have lost some footage by reusing physical carriers. So uh, that's something we've learned from, um, but maybe someone else of the panel can, uh, can give some insight as well. Uh, well, in planning our big digitization project, we also had uh, this uh, discussion whether someone else would might to need our then uh, no longer needed digital tapes or IMX uh, tape cassettes. In fact, nobody was really interested uh, uh, and all the costs for wiping those uh, uh, getting all the di different stickers uh, from it to be uh, uh, data safe here and all these things. Uh, would in the end uh, cost much too much uh, to, to find here a proper solution for all sides. Therefore, we do just recycling in uh, things of, uh, we have a partner here, but we are uh, just disposing um, with the different plastic types uh, then, uh, and things like that. So there is some kind of recycling, but not the tapes itself. And on hard drive, it's the same uh, as with, with VRT on our side. 
I don't know if the question was about the recycling, um, not for use as as the car as carrier, but uh, um, because of uh, environmental concerns for all this material which is uh, uh, to, to be put in the garbage and and it's a uh, it's a critical material to dispose of. Uh, well, let's say we know that our organization for this kind of things look at laws. <laughs> Uh, and uh, um, of course, things can be improved. But the, also, LTO tapes are, are in the game because <laughs> you change the generation, <laughs> and you have the older generation tapes to be recycled somehow. Other questions? Um, oh. Yes, there there is a question from Antoine uh, who asks. Uh, uh, if we don't consider as an archive, the physical assets as an intrinsic a part of the preserved asset. Uh, actually for us as broadcasters, no. Uh, there have been some parts where we've seen uh, that, let's say the overall appearance of the signal changes after digitization. And this was our digitized uh, content uh, from umatic tapes. Color under tapes after digitization, uh, the content looks much crispier and colorful than it uh, did on the original carrier. So there was the only one where we might say that uh, the carrier itself uh, would have been uh, important to preserve uh, that certain feeling. But uh, actually, uh, our journalists who need this material, who work with this material, are only interested in the content itself and not, let's say, on uh, uh, having it from, from an original carrier, because this always brings a lot of uh, problems. And here we are talking also about uh, getting access to it and so on and so forth. So again, we are not a museum, because for a museum, it's definitely a different uh, approach here. But as a producing archive or um, a, a archive, which the main uh, uh, task is to support uh, uh, a production uh, in our company and make uh, producing television possible, uh, we don't see this for us. Now, now the questions are are, are coming oh, in. Yes, and there are other questions on a question on LTO, <laughs> for instance. Yeah. <laughs> How uh, long? Uh, we'll see. For for oh, the time is, being, is, uh, yeah. it, it is there and it's good as a kind of uh, you can put it on shelf as well. Our our set, uh, for example, our LTO set uh, set at, at uh, the Oslo Press Agency is in cold standby, so it's already in the robot, but the robot is not running. So whenever the disaster strikes and we need it, uh, it costs about uh, 50 minutes until we get access uh, to it. So this is most important here on that okay. side. There is another question, say, is it a, is it a, lack, a lack of confidence in LTO <laughs> for, for the future? <laughs> no, it's definitely not uh, re uh, reflecting a lack of confidence in LTO. It's simply the speed of access. Uh, uh, for us at ORF and for our customers, which are 90% in-house uh, usage, speed is everything. Uh, especially the small parts. So when you are working in news, you're not interested to get a two uh, uh, hour program from LTO, where it might not be that the difference between LTO and hard disk, but you just get a few uh, uh, snaps, few shots uh, from uh, news uh, items. And here the difference between LTO and hard disk is tremendously. Uh, uh, so uh, this was our main decision uh, to switch over to, to hard disk and two sets, uh, one set uh, can uh, carry all the load of a normal, let's say, a television production a day. Uh, we are working with two sets to spread the load uh, and even one can fail uh, uh, and the other one can take up for up to, uh, we tested it for three months uh, on a row and it was uh, fast and uh, well, capable enough. Yes. Well, this yeah, is- we, a... 
We have a similar setup at VRT, uh, and maybe interesting, we recently uh, replaced one of our tape libraries. So we were at the point of reinvesting, and we looked at uh, disk storage for, versus LTO storage, and just based on cost, we went for LTO storage, and we usually write off the investment in a library over eight to 10 years. Mm -hmm. So for VRT, the reassess, reassessment of disk storage will be within uh, within about eight years. Regarding the speed of access, I, I wonder uh, if this can be solved um, giving priority or um, giving a uh, quicker access to a, 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 a format which, which demand less storage. Uh, yes, but the main time takes, uh, uh, let's say, loading the tapes and winding them. This oh, is I mean, the main the... impact. This, this is definitely <laughs> the main impact. So therefore, the, the, the codec uh, and uh, uh, doesn't uh, have, have a real impact here. For example, we, we tried, uh, because we had for, for more than six years only LTO uh, uh, as the main carrier. And here we had a very expansive uh, hard disk cache which uh, held more uh, than uh, 6,000 hours, uh, which helps a lot here. Uh, but uh, at the end, uh, since we, uh, our uh, vendor, our partner here on the storage side, uh, side uh, gave us uh, this uh, opportunity to switch over to, to hard disk without any additional costs, because for them, maintaining the LTO library in the robotic was more expensive than uh, spending the same um, money in, in hard disk then. So definitely uh, it, it was for us in ORF a, a big game changer actually. Or the other thing? Well, I, I was thinking personally of uh, giving quicker access to a, a nice proxy level uh, which would be stored only on disk, <laughs> but requiring uh, less uh, less storage capacity than than the, the, uh, on, um, the mezzanine or master formats, which would be on LTO. So in that case, uh, uh, access to the best quality, you have to wait. <laughs> The, the the time of accessing the LTO tape. Uh, if you if you make the work with the proxy, you will get it immediately. You already have it there. I don't know if it is uh, this could be um, a solution also because uh, um, twenty years ago the proxy were, were really bad, <laughs> but now the the a proxy, a proxy file can be as uh, as good as that for a communication to the public. Okay, so the decision was to go on until there are questions. Uh, five minutes, <laughs> ten minutes, I don't know. How much does environmental, env environmental and sustainability factor into discussion for long-term preservation? Well. Nice, nice question. I would say uh, we are beginning discussing of of this. If it was only a few years ago, <laughs> it was not a topic. Now, now it is a topic. I, I see, the, but but without a solution yet. <laughs> First, uh, um, people think of energy and energy costs. This, this is not the only issue. I think. I don't know if uh, there are other. No, it's a, it's a really recent discussion because we we used to believe that we we couldn't do any compromise. I think in archive we need to save all the content anyway, so we didn't think we were part of the of this question. But the problem is becoming so important in every domain that we we'll, we need to now uh, think about it, and. Uh, Today, we already talked about disposing of the original uh, carriers. Maybe tomorrow we'll talk about uh, what we keep as file. Do, do we, will we keep all the content forever? Maybe that will be the next step. Uh, because if we, if we want to reduce the digital storage, which still 
consume some power, etc. Maybe that will be the next stage of the conversation. I, I'm not sure yet. Anyway, uh, there is some work being done with Fiat IFTA uh, on this, uh, especially through the Frame Initiative, which is a training uh, program. And on the website, you can find um, a link to a survey. Uh, we try to ask uh, archive people uh, where they are currently uh, regarding this issue. Are archive aware about uh, uh, environmental issues and what are they do what are they doing about it? So uh, we will present the finding findings of this survey uh, at the next conference in October. And hopefully we'll have a clearer vision of uh, what's the situation. I want to point out uh, the, the result of the polls on the question, have you implemented or thinking of constraints on growth of the collection size, which is related to sustainability? 10% they don't need, 26% they don't want, and only 20% yes by making a more selective ingest. And uh, reconsidering retention policies regularly is only 12%. So this is a, a snapshot of today. The audience of today it will be interesting to, to repeat this, uh, this question in another situation. Wow, um, thank you. Thank you, Perla. Yeah. <laughs> People are, are leaving because the time uh, is on, but uh, let's uh, try to, to answer uh, other a few a few other questions i think uh, we we can uh, have individual members uh, in initiative yes i think there is a possibility for that you don't have to be an institution yes correct i, I don't know the rate well, uh, you, but uh, it, there's a possibility it is i don't know if uh, if you belong to an institution, in that case, maybe not. But uh, well, to, to be checked on the on the Fiatifta website, hybrid storage like this archive offer. I don't know if it is a commercial thing. Uh, uh, I would only say that uh, storage technologies are always uh, now our attention, uh, but an emerging technology. Is, is is a challenge uh, because if you have a large collection, changing technology is a, is a big migration again. <laughs> uh, and uh, so a, a, a complex process and an expensive process. So any new technology is considered, but uh, uh, also costs are to be considered and time and criticalities for changing technology. At the moment, uh, there is this uh, LTO roadmap. We will uh, see in the future if uh, it stay, uh, it stay the, the main one. OK, uh, well, uh, if there are no other questions, I would uh, ask. Uh, Richard, are you there? You, you made the overview. You should, uh, you should say the ending words, the closing words. Oh, OK, I'm trying to get my microphone turned on. Um, I didn't prepare any closing words. Um, I'm, I hope that we've been able to give some information of use to some of the many people who have logged in. Um, we didn't cover the totality of digital preservation by any means. We tried to pick out some key topics that we knew enough about to try to not waste your time. And uh, I hope that you have received some benefit. Um, Laurent, do you want to say anything about making this recording available to people? It will be, yes, uh, through uh, Fiatifita website. I don't know the timing, but it will be. And some of these topics will also be um, object of presentations during the next uh, uh, World Conference of Fiatifita in October in Locarno. And uh, also, if you want to write uh, questions by email to the commission members, uh, we have uh, one one address for all the group, uh, and we try, we, we do our best to to answer. So thank you, thank you very much to to the audience, to the to the panelists, uh, to to all of you. Uh, it has been uh, uh, good. This is a seminar, I think, a good a good discussion, a good a good set of presentation. And uh, all the best for the 
summer now is beginning in the northern part of the world. And uh, so see you in autumn somewhere, <laughs> maybe in Locarno. Mm. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we, we end. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye.